transfer as possible on the data you've collected so far, and then you plan through that model using any of the planning or control algorithms that were covered the week before. Today, we're going to talk about another way to approach model-based reinforcement learning, where instead of planning through a model, we're going to actually use that model to try to recover a policy, which is going to look a little bit more like the uh, model three RL algorithms that we covered in the first portion of the course. So we're going to talk about algorithms that can use models to quickly check whether this might not actually be. Normally, this thing sounds absolutely horrible, <laughs> but um, it might be. Uh... learn global policies, the kind of policies that we're all familiar with. We're also going to talk about <laughs> algorithms that use models to learn what we could call local policies, policies that are not meant to be big neural net policies that are correct everywhere, but that are meant to be effective in a narrow region of the state space. And I'll explain a little bit for why this might be a good idea. And then in the last portion of today's lecture, we're going to and discuss how these local policies can actually be combined back into be the I global policies that we're more used to. And if this doesn't make much sense now, uh, I think it'll be a lot clearer why this is a good idea later in the talk, but we'll cover methods like guided policy search and policy distillation. Okay, so the goals for today's lecture uh, will be to understand how and why we should use models to learn policies, and then understand this whole global and local policy learning stuff. So in a sense, this lecture is kind of uh, really covering two slightly uh, separate topics that are still quite related. The first one is using models to learn policies, and the second one is this connection between global and local policies, which is often used in model-based RL, but can also be used in purely model-free RL methods, as we'll see at the very end of the lecture. Okay. So last time, I talked about model-based reinforcement learning with planning or optimal control algorithms. And in particular, the final method that I arrived at was this model-based RL that I called version 1.5, which is also called model predictive control, or MPC. So this is the method where you start off by collecting some data, then you learn your dynamics model F on that data, then you plan through your dynamics model to choose your actions using any of the methods from the week before, like MCTS, LQR, random shooting, whatever. Uh, then you execute the first action in that plan, and then you observe the resulting state S prime. Then you append the tuple S A and S prime to your data set D. And then you repeat this, so you do this every time step. And then maybe every n steps, you update your dynamics model with all of the data gathered so far. So this was the basic recipe for sort of the final model-based RL algorithm that we arrived at at the end of uh, the lecture last week. And this is, in fact, the method that you will be implementing for homework four. So homework four is currently being prepared by the TAs. It's almost ready. And when it comes out, this is what it's going to have you do. However, if we think back to uh, our discussion at the beginning of, the, uh, of this kind of model-based RL uh, portion of the course, we learned about three kind of different regimes. We learned about the deterministic open loop case, the stochastic open loop case, and the stochastic closed loop case. And as a reminder, the difference between open loop and closed loop is uh, whether or not the agent actually uh, plans to react to future observations. And the distinction is actually very important. So in the open loop case, what the agent thinks is happening is that it gets to observe the initial state, then formulate a complete plan consisting of a sequence of actions, and then has to commit to that plan. Now, in reality, the environment might still allow the agent to plan again at the next time step, but when the agent plans, it does not realize that it will be allowed to change its mind. Which means that the optimization problem that the agent is solving is to maximize the expected reward condition of a sequence of actions. <clears throat> and as we learned before, this can be highly suboptimal in some cases. So the, the example that I gave uh, 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 when I discussed this. Just to make sure that um, we can, if there are any questions to this, just feel free to stop at any point and let's discuss this. That's the whole point why we're watching these together. Yeah, so that if, if anything is unclear or anything is mysterious, then we'll talk through and try and understand what's going on. I think the <coughs> in this case, the stochastic open loop case is a, 
an extension from what they discussed in the previous lecture, mm. where they have an open loop case and a closed loop case. That's, I don't think that kind of language is used in no, the Sun and Bato. They, they have yeah. Yeah, they're not using that. Um, but the closed loop case is, um, and uh, Patrick, if you're out there and watching, please correct me. Which he's not, I can see that there's no one for us. Um, <laughs> the, the closed loop case is a case where um, the machine is planning for a fixed set of steps, for a fixed set of happenstances, for a fixed set of like, uh, circumstances. Yeah, so. Um, Closed loop is um, planning ahead, and it's sort of like um, as if your Roomba was trying to plan for a circle or something, and you put your foot in the way, mm -hmm. and the Roomba would just yeah. bump against your foot the whole time because that wasn't part of the planning. That wasn't because the environment changed, and that wasn't that wasn't necessarily covered. That would be a, an example of a closed loop planning case where it has um, worked out all its steps. Yeah. Uh, another thing on which I'm not entirely sure whether that is consider open loop is there is a way to plan like uh, five steps in advance and then plan ahead again mm -hmm. which is also I think considered open loop but I'm not entirely not entirely sure um, I was sick last week so I, I missed um, the rest of, of the discussion from last week so someone is planning every action from the initial state and yeah going through the motions yeah okay. yeah there's um, there are fairly straightforward linear models that help you do that, yeah. <coughs> which are fairly cheap to compute. Um, and it's, it's used quite often in robotics. So things like, um, if there's nothing in the way, just uh, planning everything, moving the can from here to here, from here to here, that's not very hard if the can is there. Right? So yeah. robotic movement apparently is, is planned in that way quite often. Um, it's a lot different if, um, <coughs> yeah, if there's just the can anywhere on the table or um, you have a, an environment that is changing and you don't know the environment that well. <coughs> At least that's how I think it is. So look at what it, what it says there. A stochastic open loop case. So this is just describing the. Um, this is just describing the uh, for one the probability to <coughs> go from S one to ST plus one, yeah. and then um, in terms of the actions, um, you would pick the argmax of your expected uh, reward. Yeah, the R is standing for the reward, and P is standing for the probability. So. <coughs> Yeah, in this in this equation, when you pick the argmax, you pick the action that gives you the highest reward, um, the highest expected reward for um, a given state, and then the action. <coughs> um, all of these are markup decision processes, so you, uh, where you've been doesn't um, play any role for the decision that you're making where you are right now. <coughs> you don't need any memory for this. The only um, thing that you need to know is, well, I guess I mean, you don't need any memory, that's not really, uh, in terms of the phrase, it's not really super accurate because you want it, you want, if possible, you want to have experienced, uh, like for example, sampled um, the space already, but um, you don't need any memory of where you've been in this round of the game, say, yeah. yeah. Um, the important thing is where you are, and then you take an action with the best expected outcome. It sounds very sort of formally complicated, but it, it really only means like if, let's say, if you've done this 10 times, yeah, um, <coughs> and you've got two actions, yeah, and out of, and you've, done, you've taken each action five times, and one action only got you a small reward one time, and the rest of the time it didn't get you anything, and the other reward, uh, the other action got you um, a medium reward three times and nothing two times, then your expectation would be that you get overall, on average, a higher reward if you take that second. So is that like the greedy bandits in this book? It's like, yeah, yeah. it's basically, the argmax is greedy. That's yeah. right. That's basically what it is. But with stochastic, uh, stochastic cases, you can't be sure that this is actually um, going to be the best action. You just mm. take the best guess, if yeah. you will. Yeah. 
that gives you the best chance. So that's what that's doing. Can yeah. you click the photo with this background? Is that fine for you? Sure. With you, you and me, can I? Sure. Can you click? Sure. Sorry, because I want this. I know, you need this for your... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the photos are a lot better than uh, what you guys used yeah. to do before, where you had to send, I had to send an email or something, so... Yeah. One more there. One more there. Sorry. One more there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, uh, it's before and after. Uh, no, sorry. <laughs> Didn't know you were a celebrity. <laughs> um, not really. <laughs> we, I think we're just a really central meetup <laughs> that is at the right time and allows people to go home early. Thanks, Beverly. Thank you. Do you want me to retake that one? No, I have to attend two more seminars this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that for uni? It's the first time yeah, was that if time. I were to tell you that uh, I would give you a uh, an out you could quiz at the end of this lecture. So that's that's S1. So the knowledge you observe is there will be an algebra quiz. And then I ask you to give me the set of answers that you would write down on your answer sheet for that quiz. So that's your plan A1 through AT. This would be a very difficult control problem because without having observed what the quiz is, you can't really tell me what a good set of answers is. So you might know all about how to solve algebra quizzes, but before you've actually observed the next state, you can't commit to a course of action that would result in a good outcome, even though you know basically how to solve this kind of control problem. Okay. So the alternative to the, to the open loop setting is the closed loop setting. And the closed loop setting looks a lot more like the uh, kind of classical reinforcement learning problems we've seen before, where now you have a policy inside this distribution, so you have a joint distribution over states and actions rather than a distribution over states conditioned on actions, and you're optimizing over the policy. So now, as you optimize over this policy, uh, you can essentially reason about how, well, if I observe this state, then I'll take this action. If I observe this other state, then I'll take this other action. So instead of committing to a single plan, a single sequence of actions, uh -huh. you commit to a strategy. A strategy that says, if this so happens, do that. It backwards. <laughs> the closed loop is the policy that allows you to choose a certain action for a certain state. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> whereas um, the uh, open loop case from before gives you the mm, gives you this vector of actions that's okay. chosen this way because you're taking the um, so it's giving you the like this mm -hmm. and that and this and that yeah well that closed loop is just giving you this next for this action. yeah the next action is just determined by the state that you're in yeah. whereas here you've got a vector of actions yeah. for your entire time <coughs> one to t yeah. and this gives you the, um, this is the sum of your expected reward. Uh, the <coughs> this is the sum of rewards given this vector yeah. of action. So for state one, you're in, uh, you take A1, for state two, you take the next selected the action. So you're just selected getting the total state. reward up front for that. Yeah. No, not getting the total reward up front. This is just the. So just the first step. Yeah, this is just the reward that you expect to get. Or this is the no sorry this is the series of arguments that you choose yeah. um, so that you get um, the maximum expectation because this is all stochastic stuff so otherwise it would just simply be um, it w uh, I think it would still be an expectation because of the transition probabilities but assuming it's, it's fully deterministic and um, if it was like a checkerboard thing where there are no transition probabilities, so um, you, if you want to go north, you definitely go north. Yeah. yeah? Um, then there, uh, this this calculation gets a lot easier. And then you would, <coughs> I think you would still call it an expectation, but it wouldn't be a um, <coughs> um, a sum that's influenced by by these probabilities where you might not get what you expect. So it would be a lot easier to calculate. But it would be your your um, your vector given. He, uh, here, and then all the states coming from this vector summing up, and you would just simply maximize um, the total sum of rewards yeah. of all those states, and you would just collect this vector 
as a series of actions. You wouldn't even know, need to know where you are at the time, as long as you, at each time step, then execute this action. I think that's the, that's the open loop case. I'm a bit confused as to why this is called open loop. This feels closed to me, whereas the other thing feels open to me. I'm not entirely sure it's how this works. Much, I must admit. The example that I gave uh, uh, when I discussed this the first time was that if I were to tell you that uh, I would give you a, uh, an algebra quiz at the end of this lecture, so that's, that's S1, so the knowledge you observe is there will be an algebra quiz, and then I ask you to give me the set of answers that you would write down on your answer sheet for that quiz, so that's your plan A1 through AT, this would be a very difficult control problem because without having observed what the quiz is, you can't really tell me what a good set of answers is. So you might know all about how to solve algebra quizzes, but before you've actually observed the next state, you can't commit to a course of action that would result in a good outcome, even though you know basically how to solve this kind of control problem. Okay, so the alternative to the, to the open loop setting is the closed loop setting, and the closed loop setting looks a lot more like the uh, kind of classical reinforcement learning problems we've seen before, where now you have a policy inside this distribution, so you have a joint distribution over states and actions, rather than a distribution over states condition on actions. That's why it's open and closed, I think. With the, with the first one, you have to see the next state and then decide. I guess that's just what I should, it should explain it. And you're optimizing over the policy. Sense. It's so now, it's your only, your as you optimize this policy, uh, you can essentially reason about how, well, if I observe this state, then I'll take this action. If I observe this other state, then I'll take this other action. So instead of committing to a single plan, a single sequence of actions, you can commit to a strategy. A strategy that says, if this happens, do that. If this other thing happens, then do this. And you can do better if, you, if you're allowed to do closed loop control. And of course, closed loop control includes the kind of stuff that we discussed in the first portion of the course, these kind of heavyweight neural net policies that attempt to output a good action in all parts of the state space, uh, which I'm going to call global policies. But it also includes kind of a, a, a simpler kind of closed loop control, or maybe you have a policy pi that is good in some region around the trajectory. <clears throat> so for example, when we talked about LQR in the optimal control lecture, we saw that LQR doesn't just produce an action, it actually produces a feedback matrix that I call capital K and a feed forward term called little k. So you could imagine that as the state changes a little bit, this feedback matrix will slightly vary the action and provide some degree of resilience to, uh, to changing states. So this is the kind of thing that I would call a local policy, something that gives you uh, appropriate feedback in a narrow region around the, the particular plan that you constructed. Both of these are closed loop controllers. This one is a closed loop controller in a very large chunk of the state space. This one is only going to do reasonable things in a narrow part of the state space. And we're gonna talk about both kinds today. Okay, so this was mostly recap, but does anybody have any questions about this? Okay. So let's think about how we can use models to train policies. So. We, we, we saw that there's some virtue in training policies as opposed to committing to, to individual plans. One of the things we know how to do is we know how to do back propagation and we know how to do gradient descent. We also know how to do gradient ascent just by changing the sign from a minus to a plus. So can we back propagate into a policy and do gradient ascent to maximize reward? So we can construct a little computation graph. You can do this in TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever your favorite numerical optimization packages. You can construct some nodes for your reward function, some nodes for your learned dynamics, and some nodes for your policy. And let's assume that they're all deterministic for now. You can handle stochastic dynamics and stochastic policies too. It's just a little more complicated. Everything in this computation graph can be made differentiable because you're learning your dynamics. So your dynamics may be some neural net. You're learning your policy. Maybe your policy is also a neural net. And if all you want to do is maximize the reward, you can simply set the output of your computation graph in TensorFlow or PyTorch to be the sum of rewards at all the time steps, call dot gradients on it, and get the gradient of the total reward with respect to your policy parameters. And then back propagate through it. Does anybody have any thoughts about whether this is a good idea? 
for or against? Does everyone want to raise, raise your hand and tell me either why you think this is a good idea or why you think so this is not a good idea? The data you can just back it and you're just doing the opposite of grading the same way, you're just trying to get the reward as high as possible? How many people think? Sorry, say so again. Is that, so you're, you can actually take like a data set and then you, you're just using the opposite of gradient descent and you're just trying to maximize the reward? Yeah, it's yeah, an yeah. error. Instead of, it's, excuse me. It's yeah. the same? Oh. I think though, I think though what he's, what he's aiming for is um, that if you were trying to do that here, um, you would look at it as, I'm, I'm not sure if you can look at um, reinforcement learning as supervised learning like that, yeah. because um, especially when it's stochastic, it's not like <clears throat> um, your state is a cat nine out of ten times, and one times it's a dog. Yeah. Like if you, if you were to if you were to try and classify it, for example, you would think, all right, this is a cat or this is a dog. I don't know. <clears throat> would that be a problem? Because it would. Because I've only read the first couple of chapters, mm. but the, the whole thing they were talking about exploration versus exploitation. Like yeah. Would it just exploit if you just trained it on? Historical data. Um, well, yes and no. I think, for one, yes, you would probably only exploit. You might not simply know anything about exploration, so you might not know about um, other states. Yeah, but I would think. <coughs> hmm. Well, this I wonder whether this is meant to be a model. I think that this would work well on the kind of problems that you're doing for, like, let's say, that you did for homework two. Raise your hand if you think this would work well. Raise your hand if you think this would work poorly. Okay, so there's some, some ambiguity there, and some of you, I think, were, were kind of trying to signal your posterior probability by raising your hand for part of the time period and then putting it back down again. So you can sort of surmise that some people are like, you know, 50, 70 percent. Um, so let's say that this, uh, this process, you know, it, this computation graph extends over however many time steps are in your episode. So you said, let's say that your episode is very long, maybe it's 500 time steps or 1,000 time steps. What might go wrong when I build this computation graph and call dot gradients on it? Any hypotheses? Yes. Right, so you could get what's called vanishing or exploding gradients. Where are vanishing and or exploding gradients? Well, imagine what the derivative of the total reward with respect to this first uh, action would be. The way that you compute derivatives of that propagation is you essentially apply the chain rule. When you apply the chain rule, what you're doing is you're multiplying together a whole bunch of Jacobians. And if there are 500 time steps, you're multiplying together 500 Jacobians. Now, when you multiply together 500 different matrices, the uh, eigenvalues of those matrices have a very profound effect on what the resulting product looks like. So if they tend to have eigenvalues less than one, when you multiply them all together, their product will have eigenvalues close to zero. If they have eigenvalues greater than one, when you multiply them all together, their product will have eigenvalues close to a very, very big number that will overflow your floating point uh, uh, computations. So that's called vanishing and exploding gradients. So the Basic procedure, as you might have already anticipated, is you run your policy, you collect some data, and then instead of planning through your model F, you back propagate through F into the policy to optimize pi theta. And the trouble with this is that you get big gradients over here, or vanishing gradients if, you have, if your Jacobian so eigenvalues less than one, and you typically have very, uh, you know, much more reasonable gradients towards the end. And this is very much also like the problem that we saw before with shooting methods versus collocation methods. So if you have this big, long trajectory that results from taking some action at the beginning, changing the action at the beginning will sort of wiggle that trajectory in really big ways far outside of the region where the linear approximation obtained via the derivative is reasonable. Okay, so vanishing and exploding gradients in the parlance of deep learning. 
this kind of sensitivity issue in the parlance of optimal control, but one way or another, this basically amounts to very poor numerical stability. So, so uh, you have kind of similar parameter sensitivity as shooting methods, uh, but you no longer have convenient second order LQR like methods for doing this because your policy is so complicated and nonlinear yeast, and you really have to rely on first order optimizers, which are not good for trajectories. Uh, and this kind of a similar problem to training long RNNs with backcrop through time. So that's where the term vanishing and exploding gradients comes from. It comes from study of recurrent neural networks, where people figure it out pretty early on that if you have long temporal structures like this, unless you do something very clever, it'll, it is very difficult to get meaningful derivatives over here with respect to a loss at the end over here. Now, in uh, the world of deep learning, where we have to do backpropagation through time, we typically have some tricks at our disposal. For example, we can use a special form for the functions that are on the backbone of this temporal uh, chain. In particular, we can use structures that result in nice, well-conditioned gradients. That is, structures whose Jacobians tend to have eigenvalues close to one. Uh, so the LSTM is one example of this. Uh, various temporal attention schemes are also good examples of this. While this works very well for training recurrent neural networks, it's unfortunately not really an option for us when we're doing model-based reinforcement learning because we don't actually get to choose this f uh, in the sense that this f really needs to just mirror the dynamics of the real world as closely as possible. So it needs to be trained to produce next states that would actually occur in reality and the real dynamics might have very uh, ill-conditioned Jacobians. So we could, of course, sacrifice the fidelity of our model for the sake of making it more differentiable, but then we'll get policies that don't necessarily do well in the real world, but only do well under this made-up model. If we instead make the model as accurate as possible, it might have Jacobians that are very ill-conditioned. Okay, so what are some solutions to this? Uh, we saw that it's kind of tough to backpropagate through this whole thing, so Somehow we need to do something a little bit better. Uh, maybe something that is not first order. Maybe something that avoids backpropagation altogether. What can we do? What are some ideas? Do you guys have any ideas about how we can use our models to train policies without these uh, nasty products of lots and lots of Jacobians? Yeah. So the answer was, well, maybe we can do a sort of a ResNet-like approach. This kind of makes sense in some cases. Like, for example, what if uh, you're controlling some, uh, you know, real-world physical system that, that, that's modeled as a collection of rigid bodies? You know, for a lot of physical systems, a very convenient uh, type of model is uh, like a partial differential equation model. So instead of uh, modeling, you know, SD plus 1 as a function of SD80, you model S dot. And then you say, you know, ST plus 1 is ST plus delta T times S dot. And now that will have a dominant diagonal, which makes sense for some kind of dynamical systems, but maybe doesn't make so much sense for other dynamical systems. Like, for example, what is this at Atari games? You know, Atari games probably aren't uh, well modeled by that kind of thing. Any other ideas? Another question. That could you, if you had, like, a bunch of model data? Yeah. Are you able to just put that forward through the, the reinforcement? Here's the thought. Oops. Sorry. When we learned about policy, because then you can, because then you know what the exact reward was. I'm not sure. So I didn't, I didn't hear the word you used. What, like if you forward propagate instead, so you've got your model data, mm -hmm. and you just put it forward, and then you try to. Like if you just, if you just had it as like this is, you had it go through the states. Yeah. In the, in the like from the um, from the training data, so you just had this state. And then that was the reward you got in this state, and that yeah. was the reward you got in this state, and that reward you got. Could you just feed it in forwards instead? So you're like pushing through the environment, but you're just basically forcing it to go. Hey, uh, I don't know. I probably don't know enough to really think about it. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you're trying to do with the neural net. How that would be different from the backdrop that he. Um, <coughs> talking about because you would somehow have to somehow you'd have to get the knowledge of the rewards or about the rewards into your system and I think the model that they were trying to build was um, every time like for this F every time they look at a state and a possible action they model the next state out of it I think that was how this model was supposed to be trained 
And so, um, what you're describing seems like an imitation learning um, yeah. approach, and that does exist. Uh, that is, um, yeah, I wonder if you could do that with deep Q learning, for example, because you'd need some kind of, you'd need some kind of um, quick update, and I think that is something that you could maybe do for the policy, but not necessarily for um, the model, the way that this is. If I, if I understand this correctly, they're still trying to make a model. Here it says, uh, backpropagate that straight into the policy. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what he means by that. Because I thought this was about sort of model-based reinforcement learning where you have a model or you make a model that tries to give you <coughs> the next state for your, um, for what the real world would do. Yeah. yeah. And hence he was talking about <coughs> whether your model was, um, real world accurate or not, and then to train on this model. If you were to train on um, just the data itself, um, that is of course uh, a, a model, if you, if you will, samples as model. I think what they're trying to do is to um, rely on more than just the samples. Yeah. Get something, get, yeah, get something out that's, that's um, not included in the sample, so that's better than the sample, so I think. Yeah. Mm. So they're trying to make a model that describes the states. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, that's, that makes that's a more sense because I'm just yeah. confused about that's the model. Yeah. 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 Because otherwise you would just have um, either a replay buffer, which is a fairly common thing to, to keep. So you, you move through the environment and you keep a lot of the. <coughs> uh, these uh, tuples of like a state, action, reward, and next action, um, and whether you're done or not, and you keep that information, and then at the end of your training, um, you shuffle that and review, I don't know, half of them or all of them or whichever. And <clears throat> often having a really, really big replay buffer helps a lot with, uh, with training. Um, but I think the replay buffer is a sort of uh, memory intensive model kind of version. Okay. And I would imagine they're trying to, to work around that here. But I'm still not I'm still a bit fuzzy about what they're <coughs> what the what the model is that they're trying to achieve. So I, I think this F that he's talking about is, is the model of the world. The gradient. Then we need to do backdrop through time for policy gradient. Somebody else? Some of policy gradient avoided backprop through time. Let's, uh, so this is going to be the first class of methods that I'm going to cover, actually. Um, it's a little peculiar. So the idea here will be to use derivative-free or model-free uh, RL algorithms, but actually using the model to generate synthetic samples. And this seems weirdly backwards because we went through all this trouble to acquire a model. Like, you know, the whole point of model three was that we didn't need a model. Now we went through all this trouble to acquire a model. And now I'm going to tell you, and eh, let's just go back and do the model three stuff. And we'll just use the model to sort of generate fake, fake synthetic experience. So this seems weirdly backwards because we did a bunch of work to get away from the model three stuff. And then we're going to go right back there again. But interestingly, I thought that's what he was trying to do. Maybe I've been missing out. Maybe I should rewatch the last couple of lectures because I might have missed out on um, what he is saving on or what they're uh, making more efficient with the, the model based RL stuff. Because <coughs> I didn't see another way other than doing it. Oh, okay. But it actually works very well. Uh, it's essentially a kind of a model based acceleration for model free RL, and there are a number of methods that do some varying on, of this. And there's actually good reason to believe that this might actually be a good way to use a model. So I'll discuss that uh, a bit in the uh, first part of the lecture. And then in the second part of the lecture, I'll discuss an alternative uh, class of approaches which use policies that are simpler than neural nets. So when we talked about LQR uh, the week before last, we saw that 
for very simple policies, for specifically for linear policies, we could actually construct a dynamic programming algorithm that constructs the policy incrementally from the last time step to the first, and the corresponding method is actually very similar to Newton's method, making it a second-order optimization procedure. Turns out that second-order optimization, if you can do it, mitigates many of the problems uh, with these uh, products of ill-conditioned Jacobians because it essentially preconditions your gradient with exactly the right preconditioner. So if you can get away with doing a second-order optimization, which you usually can't if you're doing neural nets, but you can if you have very simple policies, then you can overcome these issues. So you could do what's, uh, what's called LQR FLM, uh, linear quadratic regulators with fitted local models. So that's if you don't know the model, you fit the model and then do LQR. That gives you local policy, so it doesn't give you a neural net policy, but you can then combine these local policies into a global policy to solve more complex tasks. So I'll discuss that in the second half of today's lecture. But first, let's talk about this oddly backwards idea of using model-free optimizers with models. Okay, so to try to understand what's going on here, let's look at the form of the policy gradient. So this is our, our favorite equation from, the, from this course, from the first half of this course. This is the policy gradient expressed in the grad log pi times q hast kind of notation. And now that we've talked about back propagation through dynamics, one of the things that you might notice about this equation that's quite appealing is that you never have to actually apply the chain rule. You never have to multiply the derivative of the next state given the current action by the derivative of the current action with respect to the policy parameters. That might first seem a little peculiar, right? It's like how do you differentiate a sum of, of, of rewards over time without actually having to back propagate through time? But that's exactly what the policy gradient allows us to do. And the, the key idea, the thing that enables the policy gradient to do this, is that, of course, the policy gradient is taking the derivative of, of an expectation. And when you take the derivative of, of an expectation, then what you can uh, do is you can simply uh, consider the derivative of the probabilities of all the samples rather than uh, the, the actual uh, forward and, uh, dynamics function. If you look at the, the regular kind of back prop through time gradient, then you see something more like what you'd expect from the chain rule. You see a product of a whole bunch of Jacobian terms. So you have the derivative of the state at time t with respect to the action at time step t minus 1. Then you have the derivative of the action at time step t minus 1 with respect to uh, the state at uh, t minus 1, et cetera, et cetera. All of that multiplied by the derivative of the reward at state uh, s. And of course, if your state is not continuous, if your state is discrete, this, is, this doesn't even make any sense. And if your state is continuous, but your time horizon is very long, this will be very ill-conditioned. Now the funny thing is, um, okay, there's a, there's a little bit of a detail here that I've, off, that I've kind of obfuscated, which is that one of them is for stochastic systems and the other is for deterministic systems. But you can actually modify the, the regular kind of backprop gradient to handle stochastic systems using something called the reparameterization trick, which I won't cover in today's lecture, but it is covered in the variational inference lecture that you'll watch online. So there's a way to turn this backprop thing into something that can handle stochastic systems as well, at which point the backprop gradient and the policy gradient are in fact calculating the same gradient, but they're just doing it differently. And because they're doing it differently, they have different trade-offs. The trade-offs are things that you, we might have, you, you guys might have already kind of uh, uh, guessed uh, from before. So the policy gradient does not backpropagate through time, but it pays a price. The price that it pays is very high variance. The backprop gradient doesn't pay that, that high price in variance, but it has to contend with very poor numerical conditioning if you have very long horizons and Jacobians with eigenvalues that are not one. So there's a trade-off. But uh, the nice thing about uh, the policy gradient is that the high variance can be reduced if you take more samples. Usually this is a problem for us because usually we would say that samples are kind of expensive because you have to go and interact with the real physical system. But if you have a model, generating more samples is simply a matter of paying more compute. You can in fact do it in parallel. You can have you know, giant batches of 10 million uh, trajectories all being rolled out at once through your giant R, um, neural network model and then use those giant batches to get a very good estimate of the policy gradient. So uh, the policy <coughs> gradient can actually be more stable if you use enough samples because it doesn't require multiplying to get lots and lots of these Jacobians. 
Uh, and if you want to learn more about this, there's actually some more detailed analysis in this recent paper from 2018 uh, that actually studies this in more detail and actually argues that in many cases, even if you can use a backdrop gradient, the policy gradient, the so-called score function gradient, might be preferred. Um, I'm not going to really talk about this kind of approach in more detail uh, because it's really very straightforward. You just train up your, your model. It's, it's essentially the approach on this, uh, this slide, except that instead of step three being back propagated through up into the policy, step three is now run policy gradient with huge numbers of samples generated by your model. So you just change step three to use policy gradient for many iterations using synthetic data, and that's basically the method. Okay. So that's the idea. Now, this idea is uh, nice because it overcomes that uh, kind of poor numerical conditioning, but it has some other issues. Uh, in fact, the issues that it has actually also get exacerbated as you have longer and longer trajectories. Does anybody have any hypotheses about what the issue would be? Yes, exactly. So the, the answer was, well, if your model is inaccurate, and your model is always inaccurate, let's face it, if your model is inaccurate, then the longer you uh, roll out your model, the more those errors compound. So if your model makes a little small mistake at the beginning, then it'll make a slightly bigger mistake at the next step, and a slightly bigger one, a slightly bigger one, a slightly bigger one, a slightly bigger one, and then eventually just produces something that has no bearing on reality. So if we're going to say that, well, we'll use policy gradient and we have a long horizon problem, we want to do it for long horizon problems because otherwise, the, you know, for long horizon problems, this backdrop gradient really explodes, so we'll use the policy gradient. But now, in order to use the policy gradient, we have to roll out our model for a huge number of steps. And even a model that's very good, if it's, if it's even a tiny bit off, if you roll it out for enough steps, eventually it'll produce some garbage there at the end, and that will cause your uh, policy gradient estimate to be nonsense, no matter how, how many samples you take, simply because your model is not good. And this is a general trend that we see time and time again in model-based RL, that while it's generally not too hard to get accurate models on relatively short time scales, getting models that are very good for extremely long horizons is tough. So it'd be very nice if we could do something like this, if we could use model-free optimizers, but not have to roll out our model for extremely long uh, trajectories. So this is where the general category of what I'm going to call Dyna-like methods comes in. So uh, Dyna is a uh, particular kind of hybrid model-based model-free algorithm <coughs> proposed in this paper called uh, Integrated Architectures for Learning, Planning, and Reacting Based on Approximate Dynamic Programming. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, integrated architectures and dynamic programming were really cool things, so you wanted to put that in your title. Um, so these days, you put other buzzwords in your title, but uh, same basic principle. Um, and what Dyna is, it's essentially an online Q-learning algorithms algorithm that performs model-free RL, but also uses a model. I'm going to describe the actual Dyna algorithm, and then what I'll describe is a kind of generalization that has been more commonly used in uh, recent algorithms. So the classic Dyna algorithm looks very similar to online Q-learning. In classic Dyna, uh, it's, a, it's an online procedure, so every single time step you're going to, do, you're going to follow this process. You're going to uh, start with some state S, and then you'll pick an action A using an exploration policy. This is just like in Q-learning. In Q-learning, you just pick an action using whatever your exploration policy is, typically some kind of like epsilon greedy thing, something that kind of uses your latest Q function, but adds some randomness to it. And then you'll observe the next state S prime and the reward. So that gives you your transition S, A, S prime, R, just like in, in online Q-learning. So, so far, this is exactly the same as Q-learning. And then what you're going to do is you're going to use this transition to update your model. P hat S, give, S prime given S A, and you'll also update a model of your reward. If you know your reward function, you can skip this step, but in general, if you don't know your reward function, you should also learn a function approximator for that. And then in step four, you'll do the same thing as in QLearn. You just use this transition to update your Q function. So, so far, we haven't really used our model in any way, and except for step three, this is exactly online QLearning. 
But now we're going to do the, the new thing. We're going to repeat this uh, little loop for k times steps. Um, why k? Well, because you can do one, but k is more general. Um, and here's what you're going to do. You're going to sample some state action pair from the buffer of past states and actions. So you'll just say, OK, now that I've taken this step, let's rewind back to something I saw before and pull out an SA tuple. And then you're going to do a Q function update on that old SA tuple, but you're going to calculate the expectation, the, the target value, by using your model. So as your model gets better and better, your estimates of this expectation get better and better. So essentially, you train on your latest transition, then you go back in time, load up some old transitions, use your improved model to predict what the distribution of next states for that old transition would have been, and then train on those as well. Now, at this point, many of you might be thinking, well, OK, there's like some arbitrary decisions going on here. Like, for example, you could just sample a state from your buffer and then sample the action from your policy. Uh, why k? Why, why not you know, have an outer loop around this? You could use the model in this expectation and in this expectation, or just one of them. So there's like a lot of choices to be made. And in many ways, the particular recipe in the original dynamo uh, algorithm is a little bit arbitrary. But you can sort of see the general gist of the idea that you're going to use your model. You're going to improve your model every step along with your Q function. And then the model will give you better estimates of expected uh, next step Q values for all of your past transitions. And that will allow your Q function to get better and better as your model gets better. So that's the, the basic recipe of the classic Dyna algorithm. Does anybody have any questions about this? Where are we using the model? Where are we using the model? We're using the model to compute this expectation. So in the target value, you have an expectation over the next state. Uh, when you actually took that transition, you received a sample of the next state from the true dynamics. But your model can hopefully give you better uh, estimates of that whole distribution, which will give you a better target value. OK. So now what we're going to do is we're going to generalize this Dyna recipe <laughs> into a kind of a, a class of Dyna style algorithms. And these will be a bit more representative of what we actually see in kind of modern deep RL methods. So the general Dyna style recipe, which is kind of a generalization of the classic method on the previous slide, is this. You collect some data. You collect this data however you want. And this data consists of some transitions, S, A, S prime, R. So you could take one step, or you could take a million steps, or collect some data. Um, so there's your data. Step two, learn your model using that data, and optionally also learn a reward model. And then step three, repeat this k times. Sample some states from the buffer, so from that data that you collected. Maybe you sample these orange states. Choose some action in each of those states. And you can choose that action in a variety of ways. So the classic Dyna algorithm would just pick whatever action was in the buffer. But you can also pick the action from your policy. Or you can pick the action at random. You can pick the action however you want. And then simulate the next state using your model. So sample the next state from your model, given the state that you chose from the buffer and the action that you chose according to whatever strategy you want. So that gives you a little transition from each of those orange dots. And then train uh, on this uh, transition, on this synthetic transition where S was from the buffer, A was chosen according to your strategy, S prime was obtained from your model, and R was obtained from your reward model. <coughs> you can train on this right away, so you can sort of get your transition and consume it immediately, or you can squirrel it away in your synthetic data buffer and then do something more like an experience replay strategy. Both would be totally fine. Uh, optionally, you don't have to take just one step, you can take multiple steps. And that's OK, too. So if you believe that your model is good for a couple of steps, take it for a couple of steps, and then you get even more varied data. So the nice thing about this kind of general recipe is that it only requires uh, short rollouts from your model, as little as one step, which means that if the errors from your model compound, this might not be nearly as big of a deal with this type of recipe. And you still see uh, very diverse states. So uh, because you're, you're actually branching from all of these states in your buffer, you can uh, do some training on states that were not actually seen in the real data, but are kind of similar to them. So this is the high-level recipe for uh, actually a pretty broad class 
of modern model-based RL methods. Um, here are a few examples. There's some paper references here at the bottom. You can uh, read up on those. And uh, basically, for these three, they all follow uh, this kind of particular, uh, you know, instance of, the, of this recipe. So they, so they take some action, observe some transition, add it to a buffer, sample a mini batch from the buffer, use that mini batch to update the model, then sample some other states from the buffer. For each of those other states, perform a model-based rollout using whatever uh, the latest policy is. So that kind of produces these little mini branched rollouts. And then they use all the transitions uh, along these rollouts to update the Q function. And the differences between these different methods are in terms of uh, whether they train together on model-based and real-world rollouts, or just the model-based ones, or just the real-world ones. There's also a difference in terms of whether you use these rollouts to estimate target values, or whether you also use them uh, to, uh, as, the, as the, the current state in action on which to actually train the Q function. So there's a variant on this recipe where you use these little rollouts to get better target values, but you only ever update the Q function on the real states. And there's some trade-offs uh, about whether you should or should not do that. A question? Mm -hmm. The model, the reward, and the uh, Q function. Yes. Yeah. Doesn't it run a problem when you're optimizing these three things in sequence? Right. So the question for those of you that didn't hear is, uh, it, there are kind of three separate function approximators here. There's the, the Q function, the, the dynamics model, P hat, and then potentially also the reward model R. If you're doing actor critic, you also have a policy. <laughs> uh, so you might have as many as four. Uh, so don't you have a problem because you're sort of uh, optimizing these things, and they all kind of interact with each other. They do interact with each other. In practice, for this type of method, it doesn't tend to be that bad, because you would typically train your uh, model and your reward model on all the aggregated data seen so far, which means that the effect of a change in Q function on the model is heavily damped. So your Q function does influence the data that the model sees, but because of the you, because you're aggregating all the data, a, a kind of a moderate change in the Q function won't radically change the data seen by the model. So in practice, the model doesn't get destabilized by the Q function. And then as a result of that, the Q function doesn't really get destabilized by the model either, because the, since the influence one way is limited, the influence the other way gets limited too. So for some methods, like actor-critic methods, that dependency between the two models can be uh, really delicate. So the dependency between a policy and a Q function for actor-critic methods can cause a little bit of uh, kind of chattering back and forth. For model-based RL, it's typically not nearly as much of a problem. Okay, um, so uh, why is this a good idea? Well, it's a good idea because we have short, uh, short length rollouts for our model, but we can still greatly increase the amount of data that we have for training the Q function. Uh, why is this a bad idea? Well, let me ask you guys. What, what, do, what do you guys think might be some bad things about this? Yeah, so one possibility is that maybe initially your model is no good, uh, and you generate transitions from it, you use them to train your Q function, and your Q function just, just really tanks from that, and then you have a garbage Q function. So that could definitely happen, and you do, in practice, need to be quite careful with these kinds of methods to make sure that you get a good model. And sometimes, sort of a, a very delicate choice to be made is how long you choose those rollouts to be, depending on how much you trust your model. This last paper called What to Trust Your Model, appropriately enough, actually discusses this issue and actually derives some bounds on how long your law should be for a given uh, level of improvement. Um, any other hypotheses? Yes, Sasha. Yeah, right. So, so this, is, this is sort of the, the, tough, uh, the tough criticism. It might seem like it's a little weird to use a model to improve your Q function because you know, for some things like, like image pixels, it might actually be harder to train a good model than it is to train a good Q function. And this is actually like, you know, to be perfectly upfront, this is, this is kind of one of the bigger mysteries for this class of algorithms, is that it seems uh, very hard to precisely disentangle the kind of situations where learning a model is easier than learning a Q function, especially since a Q function is, in a sense, a kind of model that predicts future rewards. Um, and uh, while there are a few results that kind of go either way, as far as when is it a good idea, when is it not a good idea, in general it's probably fair to say that people don't really understand this as well as, uh, as maybe we should. Uh, there was another comment back there? Mm -hmm. um, is there uh, any drawdown to the Yeah, 
So, so the question was, are there any drawbacks with making these rollouts too short? Well, the shorter you make them, essentially, the less you benefit from your model. So if you make the rollout of length one, you're kind of incurring the least error from your model, but you're also seeing the least new stuff. Uh, so the trouble is that if you want to change your, your Q function a whole lot without collecting a lot more data, eventually you basically run into this problem where the data you collected before in step one is just too different from what you would see if you were to follow the greedy policy with respect to your current Q function. So while you can train up your Q function really well in that data using these one-step uh, rollouts, when you actually run the policy with respect to that Q function, you see totally different things that you're not prepared for. All right, uh, so that's... That's a good um, spot. So if I understand this correctly, <coughs> are they doing that in between each step? So with the, with the Q function, you have um, an update after each time step. So you, you, um, it's a, uh, you get what's called the TD error, the temporal difference error, which is the error between um, kind of what you expected from what you've already known about um, the the state and action um, that you've like the state that you're in and action that you've taken, and what really happened. Mm. And um, <clears throat> it seems to me like mm, in this case the if if they do this after every step and then sort of kind of like play around, if you will, after every step using this model, which also gets better with every step, then I would assume that. Unless the model finds something or predicts something that might be better than what you would have done from the situation that you're in, um, you're going to correct the model anyway as you're taking the action that you've been playing around with mm. in the simulation that you're rolling out. Unless, of course, the model wrongly predicts that this would be a bad action or something and then you would do something else. So I'm just trying to understand it. Yeah. Is so the basically the Q learning is the is the squiggly line, and the the basically the model's just suggesting a different action. So it's almost the ex the exploration. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. Q learning is sort of the safe. Uh, the Q yeah the the way I understood it was the the um, the Q learning is learning a. Let's say you have a, like my, my perfect example is also Roomba. So if you have a Roomba and the Roomba um, <coughs> drives through your living room, and the way I understand this one is that is the Roomba takes one step, yeah, and then it checks what it expected and so on and so on, and <coughs> updates the, the model with the um, transition probability and the raw that it got and all of that. And then um, sitting there, it kind of imagines what if I went that way, what if I went that way, by applying the policy that it has to the model, and instead of actually moving in the real world, playing, like running these in the model, and then updating its Q function, its expectation, the Q function being, um, the Q value being the value of an action in a state. Yeah. So where the state value is the value of the state that you're in, um, taking into account all possible actions in the state, the Q value is the uh, value of a specific action that you and that's why the Q learning is called Q learning. It's just greedily trying. It's it's very straightforward to look at in a in a deterministic um, uh, problem. It's trying to uh, literally learn the discrete steps in kind of the optimal um, uh, sequence of actions to take yeah. for um, uh, a certain problem. So it's applying the model to test. But what exactly, happens. and here is it. Here it's applying the model to test what happens. And to try and improve the um, uh, improve this Q function before it actually goes someplace else and does it, um, I would assume that this makes the most sense. Like he said, to w when when you can build a good model, so when you somehow have, let's say, you would have samples for an environment from a previous exploration of some sort, and then you train a new agent and you would apply this to it. So I wonder if that factor actually comes into it, the, the idea that, because um, in his drawing, all these um, the arrows that pointed far away from the, um, the trajectory that the agent was supposed to be taking, or like was, was um, the way I understood it, was eventually taking really, 
And so I wonder whether it actually has to be that way, whether it wouldn't be necessarily somewhere parallel for a while and then sort of branching off. If you go like three or four steps or five steps and not just one, like one step would, you know, not necessarily. And then that, that could also be why um, you get, of course, less um, bang for your buck out of it. Because if your model predicts the best outcome for the next step that you would have taken anyway, then you're kind of only updating where you're going mm. and then you'll never explore. Yeah. Yeah. If it was kind of greedy like that and um, the system was deterministic and there was no stochastic um, transition probability. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, since there's only two of us, I was going to suggest that we leave it at that so that you don't get completely flooded and um, there's another um, meetup setting up outside. Yeah. Um, yeah, did you have any any more questions? No, that was pretty, yeah, well, I was, don't, <laughs> I kind of, there's bits yeah. that I'm like, I get that, and then there's yeah. bits I'm like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but. It also has the advantage, yeah, if we're, if we're at this break, then this mm. is literally, a, because he's going to start the, the next half mm. after this, that should be a good point for us to start the next session from. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but by all means, feel free to um, stick around for the um, meetup after this. It's a responsible AI meetup. Yeah. And it's going to be an open um, discussion session. So it's a, um, I think it's called Chatham House Rules, yeah. where um, people from the audience are actually the participants on stage and bring up their opinions about problems or tell stories from or case studies, if you will, um, <coughs> where they can discuss how to um, uh, apply more fairness to machine learning and. Uh, it's, I guess, also sort of shooting, what's the word? Um, like throwing spanners in the works. Like if, yeah. if someone has an idea or um, asks a question and um, you've got a case where this occurred and you came across a problem, then you can use the stage and contribute that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I will say thank you, dear internet. <laughs> uh, we'll, uh, we will see you next week. Um, oops, yeah.